Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Lockerbie, and today we have Jamie Catherwood on the show. Welcome to the show, Jamie. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. You have one of the best blogs, I feel like, on the internet, Investor Amnesia. You have these Sunday reads that are so entertaining. I've been following for a long time. I really love them, and I've been really excited to have you on the show. But for those who don't know you personally yet, they might be surprised to know how young you are. Um, you're 26, <laughs> but you already have this amazing career and this amazing library of literature you've written. And you've achieved a lot for being very young, including becoming an associate at OSAM, o O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. Talk to us about how you got introduced to OSAM. You've been there for a few years now. Well, first of all, I love this podcast already. It's nice. Uh, thank you for all the compliments right off the bat. Um, and yeah, so in terms of joining O'Shaughnessy, um, I, so going back a little bit, I was a history major in college, which will be very relevant to this conversation. Um, my dad's philosophy was if you kind of want to do business and you know you're going to want to do business um, as a career, then you're probably going to get an MBA. And so his thinking was there's not really a point in doing business undergrad because you're just going to do business twice, undergrad and MBA. And so right or wrong, I took that advice and did what I was passionate about, which was history. And I went to school in London. My dad's also British um, at King's College London and did history. And the way British degrees work is you just do your major for three years for your bachelor. So I only took history classes for three years. And then along the way, I got interested in investing. But because I was only taking history classes, there wasn't really a way outside of the few economic history courses they offer to kind of learn through school about investing. And so I had a friend recommend to me that I listen to Invest Like the Best, which is Patrick O'Shaughnessy's podcast and Masters in Business by Barry Ritholtz. And so I started listening to those podcasts and just kind of wrote down every term that I didn't understand and looked it up later. In the beginning, it was <laughs> basically every other word. Um, and then when I graduated, I ended up getting a job in finance and investing, working for an institutional investment consultant in DC. And I just cold emailed Patrick one day, figured out what the kind of email format was for OSAM <laughs> and sent him this email saying, you know, you don't know me, but I kind of credit your podcast with helping me learn enough to get a first job in finance. And so if you're up for it, I'd love to kind of take you out to lunch or dinner just to say thank you. And yeah, just because you've given so much to me and I'd just love to repay it. And he responded back pretty quickly saying that he would love to get lunch. And so he didn't apparently at the time realize that I was in DC and O'Shaughnessy is based in Stanford, Connecticut. And so we set a date. And then when the day came, I just got up at like 4 a.m. and drove to um, Stanford, Connecticut to get lunch. And actually, ironically, I figured I'd already got one of the two podcast hosts that I'd been listening to and helping me get a job. And so I DM'd uh, Barry Ritholtz on Twitter and ended up actually getting breakfast with him in New York. And then he made sure I figured out the Metro North train to get to Stanford to get lunch with Patrick, but stayed in touch with Patrick. And eventually through Twitter, I uh, got to know Jim O'Shaughnessy and anyone who is on Twitter and FinTwit knows how prolific a user Jim is on Twitter and how great he is uh, with mentoring best individuals. Meme. Yeah, the best meme <laughs> dealer out there. Exactly. And um, and so I got to know Jim and then we just kind of stayed in touch. And then, I don't know, maybe two years into my first job, um, Jim gave me a call and kind of said, you know, Patrick and I have decided that you need to come work for us. <laughs> and so put in my two weeks the next morning and uh, kind of three years later, here we are. Super interesting. We love Jim. We love Patrick. They've been on the show. Love what they're doing over there with their show as well. Um, and Jim's actually coming back on the show here pretty soon. So that'll be fun. <laughs> you know, studying history is one thing. Studying financial markets and the history there is, is a whole nother thing. So what exactly piqued your interest early on to go the financial route as, as part, part of your history degree? So, I mean, as I mentioned, I took some economic history courses in college. To be honest, I found them really boring, ironically. Um, it was more along the lines of, you know, how did the a new farming technique in 18th century Britain improve GDP growth? Like that is really just snooze fest. Um, but when I graduated, I 
got into finance. And then the same friend who recommended that I listen to those podcasts also recommended I get into Fintwit because I was really big on networking. I am still big on kind of cold outreach and just trying to talk with people. Um, and so I was trying to do that on LinkedIn and he said, no, do this on Twitter. And so I got into Twitter, followed everyone he was following, which is the kind of just main finance Twitter accounts. And I saw that there were a lot of people putting out really interesting content, blogs, podcasts, etc. And I kind of missed writing because as a history major, that's basically all you do for your degree is reading and writing. And so I thought, you know, maybe there was a way that I could merge these two interests of mine, finance and history, and maybe some people would be interested in articles on that. And so yeah, I just kind of started writing a few articles on Medium. And to my surprise, they were very well received and people were interested. Um, it was just total kind of luck that there wasn't a person, at least in the financial Twitter sphere, kind of solely focusing on financial history. And so it's just pure serendipity that my kind of two main passions were an area where I didn't have to compete with someone that could be writing better than I was. Um, so it kind of just took off from there. And the more I've researched it, the more fascinating I find it because there are so many innovations today that we think are novel and are new, but there were previous iterations stretching back centuries. And all of it is really just stories and human nature because so much of finance has changed. We're not investing you know, logistically and operationally the same way as we were in the 17th century, but the people actually trading different assets are executing in the same way kind of psychologically we're making the same mistakes as the people that were trading 400 years ago yeah i was gonna say when we're saying history we're not talking about you know the fed being established in 1913 we're talking about you know the 1600s a lot oftentimes on your on your blog which is just uh super interesting and you've found somewhat of a an expertise writing about writing about bubbles mania and even fraud and when people think of bubbles i often hear them referring to it as something like tulip mania right you hear it all the time and when i was reading your research it appears something that stood out it's very surprising to me but tulip mania might actually be a misnomer so talk to us about how tulip mania has become this shorthand and how maybe it never even occurred yeah so this is a uh kind of one of the bugbears I have. And it all stemmed from Jason Zweig at the Wall Street Journal, who's become a good friend because he's an equally passionate financial historian. And he recommended that I read this book called Tulip Mania by Anne Goldgar, which only after it arrived from Amazon, I realized um, she was actually a history lecturer at King's and that I must have had at least one or two lectures by her my first year. Um, so that was funny, but her book is an amazing account of the so-called tulip mania. And what she shows is, you know, there's no questioning that people were buying and selling tulips and there were probably some ridiculous prices paid for them. But one of the, there's kind of three issues. So the first issue is that mainly people today get their idea of tulip mania from Charles McKay's Extraordinary Delusions and Madness of Crowds or whatever the title is. Um, and the problem with his research was that it was based on largely the work of a um, German, German writer in the 18th century. And that German writer had gotten most of his kind of source material from these pamphlets and circulars that were kind of floating around at the time of the Dutch tulip mania. And they were all satirical. And so what was happening is that the kind of elite class in um, Holland was unhappy that this new kind of class of merchants that were getting involved in the tulip trade were making money and kind of elevating their own status within society into the kind of upper ep echelons because they now had this money. And the wealthy people thought they weren't deserving of being in this elite class because they were kind of new money and etc. And so they started kind of putting out these um, pamphlets talking about the things you hear today when people talk about tulip mania, that 
people were, you know, getting drunk at taverns while their wife and children starved at home and they were losing all their money kind of betting on the prices of tulips and that people were paying as much as the price of houses for a single tulip bulb. People, you know, were committing suicide because they went bankrupt from losing all their money in the tulip crash. And this was all just exaggerated um, kind of stories and propaganda designed to convince people broadly in society that this was a bad thing that should be stamped out. And it was really just because these wealthy elites did not like the fact that people were kind of entering their realm of society. And so this German author in the 17th century, though, took all those pamphlets and took them as fact and wrote about them and just took every story as if it actually happened. And then Charles McKay came along, used his work as the basis for his sections on tulip mania. And now everyone just kind of assumes that this is all true accounts. And what Anne Goldgar's book found, because there's all these stories of, you know, one tulip bowl being traded like 300 times, et cetera. And Anne Goldgar spent years in the archives, you know, like tracing the transactions. And she said the longest chain that she could find was like five. And the other thing is the way that these tulips were traded is basically in the fall. Someone who actually knows about gardening will tell me I'm wrong about this, but say it's fall is when you plant the tulip bulbs and then the winter, they're just underground. The spring is when they would, you know, come up and bloom. And then that's when the person that purchased the tulip would actually get the tulip. But what would usually happen is that they were kind of like futures contracts. And so they would make the agreement to purchase in the fall, bulb go underground, and then in the spring, that's when they would actually pay for it. And so some of these absurdly high prices that people talk about, like the price of houses, et cetera, no one actually ever ended up paying that price in many situations. It was just kind of the agreed upon price. But then a lot of these transactions didn't actually end up happening because by the time spring rolled around, the people that agreed to pay that much just kind of were <laughs> making themselves invisible. They didn't, they didn't want to pay it, et cetera. And so it's just one of those things that's very interesting from a kind of human nature standpoint, how a narrative can just take hold, even though it's just not true. And so it's become the kind of go to reference for anytime someone thinks uh, it's speculative kind of fervor is ridiculous or in something that they deem stupid, then it's just exactly like tulip mania. And you know, that's it. And like, it's just become the kind of shorthand for this is dumb, and it shouldn't be going up. And so it's just like tulip mania, whether it be Bitcoin during the dot com bubble, like same thing. And so it's just interesting how it continues to persist when it's not actually based on fact. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of like, say, if someone dug up some propaganda of marketing from a magazine from like the 60s showing how doctors are recommending cigarettes and then you know all we had to go on was hey cigarettes must be great for you yeah <laughs> you know, the, the due diligence from there um yeah super, or super. like people use ramp capital and like liquidity on twitter today and their memes as like oh wow this all stuff actually happened like no it's just a meme like right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's talk about what are some of the signs of a bubble forming and then i'd love to talk about the signs of a bubble about to burst so I think one of the best frameworks for understanding kind of how bubbles form and why is the bubble triangle, um, which is a framework that my friends at Queen's University, Belfast, uh, John Turner and William Quinn wrote about in their great book, Boom and Bust. And the bubble triangle is basically a financial recreation of the fire triangle, which is uh, heat, oxygen, fuel, and then you need the spark to kind of ignite the fire. But with the fire triangle, you have to have all three sides, you know, available to sustain a fire. And if one of them is taken away, then the fire goes out because it can't survive without all three sides. And so they took that kind of approach and applied it to the formation of bubbles. And they replaced the sides with speculation, marketability, and money slash credit. So in that framework, for heat, the heat is speculation. And so that kind of doesn't even need to be explained, but obviously it's just people wanting to get in and make money on an asset that they see others making money in and prices just keep rising. And so more people get involved because they think that there's an opportunity to make money quickly and easily. And then 
the um, oxygen for a bubble triangle is marketability. And that does not mean the kind of traditional um, definition of marketing, but rather the ability to easily buy and sell shares. And so if it's easier to buy and sell an asset, then it's going to be easier for more people to get involved and kind of keep the momentum and excitement um, going. And so you need that because you can't really get national hype and widespread speculation if it's really hard to actually buy the asset. And then lastly, you have the money and credit side of the triangle, which is the fuel. Um, so as we all know, especially today, when there's low yields and cheap money and just money printer constantly burring, um, there is a lot of kind of speculative bubbles around the market, whether it's one large one or kind of a bunch of pockets of mini bubbles that can be sustained because yields are low and it's easier to finance companies. And it's also kind of pushing investors further out on the risk spectrum because they have to kind of stay in riskier assets when yields are so low. And then the kind of initial spark that sets off the overall fire once these three sides are there is usually throughout history, a technology and some type of innovation or government policy. And so in recent history, I feel like it's leaned more towards the technology side of the spark, but also um, in the 2008 crisis, you could talk about the kind of government's initiative to make sure that everybody could buy a home, et cetera, and pushing the housing industry. And th this framework, though, I think is really useful. And it kind of demonstrates how history can actually be applied to modern markets, because it's an actionable framework where obviously not every single bubble will fit this triangle, but it's a good way for thinking about whether a bubble is forming and why a bubble is forming. I'm kind of curious how you look at mania and bubbles together. For example, like right now, everyone's saying we're in a bubble. We're in the everything bubble. Even Jeremy Grantham saying we're in a super bubble. But, and maybe it's just hard when you're in it and you're myopic that you don't see the mania around you until everything's crashed and you have hindsight. But are you seeing mania in today's markets? And if so, like describe that and maybe how it compares to previous manias we've seen. So I definitely think that there are especially over the last two years, there's been no shortage of pockets of mania. I think what's interesting about today versus history is that there tend to be more mini manias today in areas of like kind of diverse areas of the market instead of one massive mania kind of dominating the whole market, um, which tends to be more the case in history. And I mean, just going back through the last two years, I don't want to even get into kind of like crypto NFT but um, JPEGs of rocks, but uh, which I do think there are merits to both of the categories I just mentioned. But I think that for me, one of the interesting examples has been with SPACs and kind of these EV companies that went public because so many of them had literally no product or no sales and were just kind of going off hype of orders and still investors were enthusiastically buying up the shares and it just makes no sense. I mean, Nikola is a prime example. I think in their first quarterly report, they had thirty-six thousand dollars in revenue, and that was from installing solar panels on Travis, Trevor Milton's ranch. <laughs> and so, but still, the price soared like eighty percent in the first month of trading. Um, we all know how that played out, but I think that that is an example um, of mania somewhat recently, and also ties into this kind of idea that I've written about before of the three eyes, which I don't know if you want to go into now or later, but um, let's go into it now. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. So the three eyes is kind of this Warren Buffett quote from 2008, where in an interview with Charlie Rose, he's talking about how in most instances of speculative manias, there's this progression from the innovator who kind of has the original idea or applies in, or creates a new technology. Um, and then there's the imitator companies, which are not necessarily bad companies, but they're just not the first mover. And so you have a, like the lift to an Uber. Um, and then the third phase is when you have the idiots, which is not applying that term to investors, but to the kind of more fraudulent and 
shady people starting companies to kind of just take advantage of the hype cycle around whatever the exciting innovation is. And so you see this play out many times over history. What I found interesting is that with this three eyes quote, um, there was actually basically an identical version of this uh, idea in an 1866 issue of The Economist, where an article stated that there were three stages to a speculation. First, the clever man, the original man, finds a good thing out. Then the whole trade sees he is right and joins. And at last comes the gentleman from the West End and upon which we know it is all over. So not the three eyes, but the exact same concept where there's kind of these three stages and there's the original guy, everyone catches on and applies the new idea. And then someone comes and ruins it for everybody by taking things too far. And with the Nicola example, I think that it's, it's, it was fascinating because it played out so quickly. Um, usually there's a more of a kind of lag between these three phases, but when Nicola first went public through the SPAC, I think in like May or June of 2020, it was occurring at a time when Tesla's shares had just been on like a wild ride. They were up hundreds of percent. I don't remember already like year to date. Um, and it was one of the popular stocks as the kind of day trading Robin Hood, everybody stuck at home crowd started getting involved. And this was a household name, Tesla. So that was a popular stock. Um, and people that had missed out on that Tesla opportunity and saw so many people, especially with the way TikToks were going around on social media, so many people were posting their gains made in Tesla. Then when Nikola came about and they were going public, then it was kind of this opportunity to get the next Tesla, um, which in this case was ironic because one company is Tesla and the other is Nikola named <laughs> same founder, um, going back to the 1800s. But, and so even though Nikola had no actual working product yet that they were selling, then it didn't matter to investors because they just wanted to get in on the exciting kind of space of electric vehicles and be early on the next Tesla so they didn't miss out again. And so despite the evidence, the stock price went up and people got over enthusiastic and then it kind of all went down uh, downhill from there for Trevor Milton and Nikola. Um, so that was interesting because it was Nikola was simultaneously the imitator and the idiot in that cycle. Um, but that was just a clear kind of progression to me of that three eyes cycle. And it was really interesting to watch in real time. Yeah. And, and Rivian was valued, I think around a hundred billion dollars before making a single sale. So I, I definitely yeah. hear your point there. You know, Buffett as a knowing Buffett, he definitely read that 1866 economist <laughs> article, which, I, you know, yeah. I, I didn't even know The Economist has been around that long, which is just also incredible. Um, you know, Buffett has another quote similar to this on this topic around the around like the proliferation of new technology. He has a quote around when the automobile first came into existence and the mania that ensued around that and how I think at that time there's around 300 auto manufacturers that came to the market. And he has this quote, I'm paraphrasing, but it's something to be effective. You would have been much better off shorting horses rather than <laughs> trying to pick a winner out of that. Yeah. And so I love this idea of tech being the spark. Talk to us about tech bubble of the 90s. And I don't mean the 1990s. I mean, <laughs> 1690s, where we had tech bubbles and bicycles and all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, and just to go back to your, your Buffett quote, um, what's fascinating about that um, era is that electric vehicles were actually the dominant form of transportation when the automobiles came about in the late 1800s. Um, and I think it was until 1912 that electric vehicles outnumbered internal combustion, kind of traditional gasoline powered automobiles. And Henry Ford's wife actually drove an electric car, um, a Baker Electric. There's a great video of Jay Leno. Um, on Jay Leno's garage driving around this 1909 Baker Electric. And so just fascinating that people think, again, it's a new, electric vehicles are a new innovation and it was actually the original. Um, so it's kind of just a century long comeback story. And well, they only go what, two miles at the time? Or something? No, that's the fascinating thing. No, yeah, some of them had longer ranges than um, cars today. I'm trying to, I have an article up here. Um, there were charging stations all over and 
yeah, some of them could go, I don't know, I want to say like 186 miles or something. Yeah, 1909 Baker Electric, the one that Jay Leno drove, could go up to 100 miles on a single charge. So it's pretty impressive. Um, but yeah, so the 90s uh, tech bubble in the 1690s is one of my all-time favorite bubbles. And that's because it was kind of sparked, not, well, I guess partially sparked by technology, but um, initially sparked by a treasure hunt. And so what happened was in the 1680s, in the late 1680s, there was this sea captain named William Phipps, and he was always around the sea docks in London. And he kept hearing rumors of this sunken treasure ship um, somewhere near South or Central America. And he heard that the ship had apparently been kind of transporting back all the riches from um, the Spanish Empire's colonies to Spain. And that somewhere along the route, I guess they had been too greedy and packed too much treasure. And so they actually sunk to the ocean floor. And so allegedly there was all this treasure just kind of sitting around. And eventually after hearing this rumor for so long, Phipps decided I'm going to actually, you know, I'm going to go see if this treasure is actually there. And so obviously it's expensive to fund this whole kind of journey yourself because you need crew, supplies, a ship, et cetera, and for months. And so that's expensive. And so he went to London to find kind of a, a group or a single investor to stake his journey and get a percentage of the profits. And so he finds this Duke, um, the Duke of Albemarle, and a the Duke and this small kind of group of investors form a joint stock company specifically designed to fund this um, this expedition. And much like modern venture capital, um, the, the group of investors would receive a payout based on whether he found the treasure or not. Um, what's also interesting is that shareholders at this time were frequently referred to as adventurers. And um, so I just let like venture capital, this is a very similar type of investment to how modern VC works. And it was literally at that time, investors were referred to as adventurers. Um, and a treasure hunt is the definition of an adventure. And so sure enough, Phipps goes off on this voyage and he finds the treasure, he finds the ship and there were actually uh, 32 tons of treasure on the ship, which is just, I mean, can't even really comprehend the size of that. It's too large a number. Um, and it takes, I want to say they spend like two full months hauling up treasure from the ocean floor and they still couldn't transport all of it back. And he comes back to London and that small group of investors, um, the Duke and his, his um, colleagues made 5,000% returns, I believe, or 10,000% returns um, on their investment. And it didn't take long for kind of word to spread of this, this just gargantuan return that these investors made and all the riches that they had achieved. And so there was a explosion in diving engine technology companies where going back to this three eyes concepts, William Phipps was obviously the innovator. He's the first person to achieve this success. And then everyone else, you know, either wants to fund a equally successful treasure hunter or come up with a way to find sunken treasure themselves. And so you started to see this proliferation of um, diving engine technology companies, which were just these bizarre apparatuses that were designed to allow a treasure hunter to breathe underwater longer with the very simple thesis just being if you can breathe underwater longer you can search for treasure longer and you can increase your probabilities of finding treasure as a result and so you had all these companies called things like the john williams diving engine technology company <laughs> and i think there was some stat that in the 17 years before Phipps's treasure hunt, there were like two patents related to um, diving engines. And then in the two years after his treasure hunt, there were 17 patents filed <laughs> in relation to diving engine technology uh, companies. And as you can imagine, none of these companies ever found any treasure. Um, and it was whole kind of just bust. But there was 
this widespread uh, excitement around diving engine technology and the capabilities and also in general because of the joint stock kind of investment vehicle that these investors staking FIPS's journey had used there was a excitement just for joint stock companies in general and so there were a bunch of um, listings in non-diving engine technology related companies um, but so there's kind of this widespread stock market bubble with a ton of ipos in 1697 um 70% of the companies that had been trading in 1694 were wiped out. So basically every of all the companies that were being bought and sold by investors in 1694, within three years, 70% of them were <laughs> wiped out of existence. And so that kind of just shows you the nature of the boom bust there. Um, but yeah, fascinating period and a really interesting and fun example of a 90s tech bubble outside of the 1990s. <laughs> and I read on your website too that there were something like 670 bicycle companies that entered the market when the first bicycle companies ar arrived. Like talking yeah. about that, that's one of my also, that's also one of my favorite bubbles that you've written about. So I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, so that um that was in the 1890s and trying to think i mean there was a bubble in the u.s actually our first panic in 1792 um not technology related but seems to be a trend of <laughs> tech bubbles in the 90s of a century um and so yeah the the bicycle mania was in the 1890s and all of what i'm about to say again comes from those two uh queen's university belfast um academics and everyone should read their book it's the great great account of this bubble but essentially what happened was in the 1890s there were a series of kind of manufacturing innovations where i don't remember all of them but they related to like ball bearings and um, kind of welding and the materials used to create bikes and the bicycle went from the penny farthing which People might not immediately know what I'm talking about, but you've probably seen those old pictures or old illustrations of the tires where it's like a massive, <laughs> bigger than you front tire and then like the tiny little tire at the back and they just look absolutely ridiculous. And during the 1890s, um, these series of kind of innovations led to the creation of the bicycle as we know it today. They look exactly the same. They kind of have that pneumatic tire and the diamond shaped frame, which made for a more easy and comfortable ride because you weren't like 15 feet off the ground. Um, <laughs> and there was just widespread excitement for this new kind of easier mode of transportation and the british public was just enamored by bicycles um interestingly it also had really significant um impacts on women's rights because it kind of modernized how women were viewed in society particularly in um, the way that they were expected to dress because with these bicycles you couldn't wear <laughs> these kind of like uh frilly you know large dresses that they were kind of expected to wear previously because they would just get caught in the spokes and crash um and so women started to kind of wear more pants etc um so just kind of an interesting side side story about how a bubble kind of revolutionized women's rights in the um 1890s in britain but yeah so once there was this kind of excitement for bicycle companies, again, a wave of entrepreneurs recognized this national excitement and started forming bicycle companies. And so in two and a half years, 671 bicycle companies were formed and traded on the, on the exchange. And it's just, I mean, I feel like there were too many to remember EV SPACs and uh, IPOs in the last two years, but the thought of 670 of any type of industry going public in two years is just remarkable. And, and how many of those 670 are around today? Yeah, exactly. What's also interesting is that some of those bicycle companies were actually the same ones that pivoted into um, electric vehicles a few years later. Um, there's one in particular I can't remember, but they were just ride in transportation mania to transportation mania. <laughs> That's so fascinating. What are the other bubbles or medias that stood out to me also? Maybe it's because I work in beverage and I just really love this story was the 
Guinness beer IPO of also in the 1800s. So things were getting pretty wonky in the 1800s, it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> well, talk to us about the, the magnitude of this mania. Yeah, so this um, transpired um, during a kind of, it actually was the kind of spark for a broader um, brewery mania in the 1880s and bled over into the 1890s. Um, and yeah, essentially Guinness decided in, I think, 1886 to list um, their shares. And when they did so, Guinness was still the kind of dominant brand just as it is today. It's recognized everywhere. And especially at that time, there was still this belief that um, there were some like medicinal benefits to drinking it. And so just everybody knew it is the main brand. And so when the company said that they were going to list their shares, everybody wanted to get in on the action. And what was interesting is you have to remember at this time, obviously, actually getting shares in an IPO is a lot more complicated than it is today because there's no electronic, you know, kind of submission process or anything. And so the um, process at that time was Barings Bank, which many listeners will know, um, they opened their doors, I think, on a Saturday for um, subscription where people could come kind of fill out their subscription forms to get um, an allotment of shares locked in for the IPO. And I think actually it was supposed to be open all day, but then within three hours, they had sold all of the available shares and the investors that had come kind of just didn't accept that. And so the Barings Bank had to call in two like police brigades to basically barricade the doors and quell the crowds because people were so kind of manic about getting a purchase of Guinness shares. And one thing that they started to do was tying these subscription forms to rocks and just hurling through the hurling them through the window of banks of this bearing bank because they couldn't get into the building anymore because the police were blocking the doors. But they just figured if I can just get this form in, maybe I can get shares of Guinness. And so they would just attach it to rocks and hurl it through the window. <laughs> Unbelievable. You know, that you you called out that they thought there was health benefits. That's super interesting because, you know, beer was originally invented to just basically acidify water because people were getting sick off the water. So I don't know if yeah. it was. But, you know, what's also interesting is my wife has been drinking Guinness to increase lactation. Like apparently, Guinness huh. is something called a galactagogue. So look up that word. That's a pretty fun yeah, word. That's a new one. But apparently, it's thought to stimulate lactation. So who would have known Guinness had uh, all these benefits? Yeah, I can't. Um... I'm just looking up quickly because uh, I guess, I mean, it's similar to kind of like uh, they say, you know, red wine has some medicinal benefits, but yeah, Guinness has, I think a lot more kind of antioxidants and other things in it. That's better than just kind of, you know, drinking a Bud Light. <laughs> and so far it hasn't proven to be fraudulent, but we'll continue to look into that. And that I want to talk a little bit more about the conditions that produce fraud. So, you know, people in recent history, maybe Enron might come to mind, but talk to us about some of these older examples of fraud becoming prevalent, you know, once the mania ensues. Yeah. So overall, it's just kind of, again, I said at the beginning that we're still making the same mistakes that we did 400 years ago, and it's because of our human nature. And I mean, it just happened. There's no shortage of examples in the last year um, where when everyone's making money, you can fight your kind of own good instinct to avoid getting swept up by a mania, but a lot of us eventually just cannot keep that kind of discipline up um, forever because you just keep seeing these people that you know well make money. That's what whatever the Buffett quote is about. You hate seeing your dumb neighbor get rich. And so I think that the reason that fraud continues to persist no matter how much information, I mean, this is, we're in the age of information, right? But throughout history, we see every time a new technology provides investors with more access to information that doesn't really impact markets in the ways that you think it would. Um, and so with fraud, when prices of assets are going up and the market is going up and people are making money, these companies, whether they be just downright fraudulent or just have questionable kind of business models, 
they're not really being exposed because if you just think about it behaviorally, if you have a fraudulent company in your portfolio and you obviously don't know it's fraudulent, but if it's making a ton of money, why are you going to look for reasons to kind of doubt the company and look for reasons why it's actually a fraud that's making you so much money? There's no reason you're just going to be so like excited that you were smart enough to, to buy it and uh, get in on it before others. And so in these periods when prices are going up, people are more kind of willing to suspend their sense of disbelief um, because they're making money and they just want to believe in the story and whatever is being fed to them by the um, company's management. But then when things in the market start to turn and prices are falling and people are suddenly losing money um, in their investments in shady or fraudulent companies, then that's when people really start kind of pouring over the business model and financials of these companies. And that tends to be when frauds are exposed. It's be And it's because people are, instead of now being previously excited about companies and just believing in whatever they're being told, now people are demanding answers and looking through detailed reports and saying, why why is this happening? Why do your financials look questionable here? Can you explain this? And then eventually management runs out of answers and the frauds are exposed. All right. So we have seen a lot of busts recently. The tech, high-flying tech companies, SPACs, even ARC has been underperforming. There's even a, there's um, Short inversion, ARC, like yeah, there's, there's yeah. an inversion ETF now for ARC. What, what could we have learned Again, if we go back to the 1800s, what could we have learned from, say, the railway boom that might have prepared us from being what I've heard you say, surprised by the inevitable? Yeah. So kind of specifically during COVID, I've just found it really interesting that so many of the stocks that were initially like soaring and, you know, they were the work from home stocks, you know, like a Zoom, Peloton, et cetera. Quickly, people kind of began to reset their expectations of future growth based on how these companies were doing in a unique environment, to put it mildly, um, and just kind of expecting that that type of record growth to happen forever, regardless of whether everyone's forced to stay at home during COVID lockdowns. And the kind of resetting expectation was not this is just pulling forward future growth. It's this is their new growth. Like now finally people discover these products and so they'll just grow exponentially forever. And Peloton obviously being the most obvious recent example, um, that is not the case. When gyms started reopening, people stopped <laughs> using solely their Peloton and went back to gyms. If you look at the um, performance, at least the last time I checked, the performance of Planet Fitness versus Peloton stock is just like the best example of how these narratives clearly shifted because one has done well as lockdowns were eased and the other has plummeted. Um, and so I just found that fascinating where you could, I mean, there's no new information that we learned from when these were the darling going to go up forever stocks. And now when they're going down and struggling, it's, you know, you could have told anyone or you could have realized back then that obviously when lockdowns end, there's going to be a slowdown in their growth. But then when that happens, it's it's as if everybody's like, oh my God, how did this happen? I never saw this coming. It's like, obviously gyms aren't just going to be shut forever. And so if you have a work from home or if you have an at home fitness product, you're not like you're going to lose your temporary kind of 100% market share for fitness because people are going to want to go back to gyms. And I don't know, I think people can just get very quickly um, swept up and convinced by a narrative and just ignore information. I mean, that's obviously the reason why we have bubbles. And so I don't know, I remember tweeting at the beginning of the pandemic that people were predicting the future of post COVID life with like the same accuracy as 1980s movies showing what 2020 would look like. And if you watch those movies, it's like by 2020, everyone will have flying cars, et cetera. And we don't, but still everyone at the start of COVID was talking about how no one will ever, ever travel for business again. Like everything is changed forever. We're not like never going back. And that's just not the case. Yeah. TV killed the radio kind of thing. It's, yeah, it's interesting how, um, 
surprised by the inevitable. I just love that quote. There's another quote I know that you and I both love from Jim O'Shaughnessy, where he says that human behavior is the last arbitrage, right? Yeah. That's kind of what we're talking about here, which is which is a good thing in some as an investor because you can, if you position yourself correctly, you can profit off of these human yeah. behaviors. And so, just reminding people that sometimes this is a feature, not a bug. If you're looking for, you know, looking at it as an investor, a smart, yeah. you know, a savvy investor, anyway. I mean, yeah, that's, um, it's, uh, there's 400 years of supporting evidence for quant investing by <laughs> just looking at these just countless kind of mistakes that all come down to human nature and doing the systematic quantitative investment approach where you remove the human element just kind of helps ensure that you don't get swept up by short term fluctuations and hype. Um, and to that point, actually, a really interesting kind of anecdote I found this week was from a book written in 1906. Um, on my website, I have a library section where there are all these um, kind of finance and investing books from the 16, 17, 18, 1900s that are available on archive.org. Um, and they're fascinating to read through. You can search by keyword, but one of the ones that I was reading was talking about how in like 1904, I think that there was a study done of 4,000 brokerage accounts over a 10 year period. And they found that 80% of the accounts showed a final loss. So 80% of these accounts lost money and that people tended to, as we still often succumb to today, buy high and sold low. And that for the people who did do well as they continued to do well they started getting more kind of gutsy with their trades and being more kind of uh speculative because they just i guess got more confident and so they started placing more larger frequent trades and that hurt them um but one of the other fascinating insights they found was again at this time you can't just trade yourself you have to trade from a brokerage office and they found that account holders who did not live near a brokerage office where they could go trade did better than local traders to a brokerage office because they just couldn't over trade on short term news. And so in this 1906 book, they say something like just this pure factor of distance restricted the um, kind of ability for people to make fools of themselves by just trading on short term news that will be irrelevant in a week. It's so interesting to me. I'm glad you brought up the quant aspect as well, because from what I've read, almost you know three quarters of the market today is traded algorithmically or in, on a quant wow. basis. Which you know, it, you would think, oh, those computers should be a lot smarter than humans. But you're seeing kind of the same bubbles, and it makes sense if you've ever modeled anything, right? If you're taking like a rolling 90-day average and projecting it forward and making assumptions based on that, and then reality sets in and, and something doesn't hit its mark, you know, you see those Peloton 80% drops all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just funny how like we've implemented all these computers to make ourselves smarter and yet we're seeing the same exact cycles. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely, you can do quant wrong just as you can do traditional fundamental wrong because at the end of the day, there's still humans creating the models. And so you have to have the kind of discipline and initial structure in place to make sure that you are investing programmatically and systematically in a way that is actually going to be successful over the long term and you're not just you know using like a one year back test to <laughs> systematically invest forever that way yeah it kind of gives me hope in a sense because you know i think it'd be hard for now uh for a computer to say hey well when the world opens back up Gyms might go, you know, gyms might perform better. <laughs> they have yeah. That seems like a hard thing to program to me, but, you know, it's probably coming. Now, one piece of trading technology that you would think would be really new may not be the case. I'm talking about ETFs. And as you've stated it, ETFs could be traced back to 10th century Venice, Italy, basically, through something called a Comenda contract. So talk to us about what a Comenda contract is and, and how it relates to ETFs today. Yeah. So um, 
before a bunch of ETF enthusiasts come after me, <laughs> this is not to say that these were literal ETFs traded in the 10th century. But so I wrote this article called The Road to ETFs a few years ago, and it was just kind of looking at the key themes um, around ETFs and their innovation. So, you know, providing diversified access to small retail traders, low costs, um, and just the ability to buy kind of fractional shares in different companies and diversify yourself. And so I started looking back throughout history just to see what kind of financial instruments were invented that offered similar characteristics. And one of the ones that I found was these um, were these commenda contracts in 10th century Venice and uh, Genoa. And what they were were essentially these, there was a couple different variations of the contracts, but essentially what they boiled down to was you had a passive investor who was the financier of a of a voyage because the the need for these came kind of going back to the william phipps example of the treasure hunt where he had a voyage that he wanted to complete but as a single kind of individual he could not fund that entire expedition himself and so he found a um, a group of investors to fund that voyage and cover the costs in exchange for a percentage of the profits. And so um, in 9th and 10th century Italy, merchants faced a similar problem where they had a bunch of goods and they wanted to sail to a distant port to sell them, but it was very costly to fund that voyage. And so the commenda contracts were kind of created to help offset some of this risk on the um, merchant side and also allow um, investors to kind of not put in necessarily 100% of their capital into one voyage because that is obviously not diversified. And so what the commended contracts were, um, they were structured so that in some cases, the, the merchant would you know, pay something like 25% of the funds voyage costs, and they would receive 50% of the profits. And for the passive kind of investor, the financier, they would be responsible for 75% of the funding um, for the voyage and also be entitled to 50% of the profits. And so depending on the type of contract, there were differences in the percentage split. But for the merchant, it was great because they only had to put up 25% of the capital and they could still receive 50% of the profits, but they also had to be the one to go actually take this journey. And at this time, there was no guaranteeing that they would make it home. There were pirates, um, you know, bad storms, shipwrecks, like ships frequently got lost at sea and never returned. And so the, it's very much an active um, investment on their part and had skin in the game. And for the passive financier just funding the journey, because he only had to put up um, that, I guess, there were, so 75% is still a lot, but there are also a lot of contracts where they had to put in only 50% of the um, financing. And so just even that allowed them to put what they previously would have put 100% into funding one voyage, they could do two voyages now where they put 50% in each. And so they were diversifying a little bit more. And then over time, these contracts kind of became even more sophisticated where there were lots of financiers funding these voyages. And so they could buy even, even smaller percentages and kind of build a portfolio of these commended contracts tied to different voyages and get payouts when, when and well, I guess if and when the ships um, returned from selling the cargo at some distant port. And so you kind of began to have this secondary market where people could also buy and sell these commenda contracts and like ownership stakes in commenda contracts to um, other people. And there's actually, I think in the 1200s, uh, really great titled um, book called the, it was written about commenda contracts and it was titled the commenda contracts of humble people. <laughs> which I took to mean, you know, small investors. <laughs> That's fascinating. And similarly, mutual funds date back farther than you might imagine. The modern mutual fund, in your words, was essentially invented sometime around the 18th century Holland. Yeah. So talk to us about what the mutual fund looked like back then compared to today. Yeah. So um, in 1774, 
there was a so actually in 1772 this is another theme that repeats often throughout history where after a crash or kind of crisis that there tends to be a wave or even just one kind of innovations usually happen after a crash or crisis. Um, and so in the summer of 1772, the price of, I believe is the British East India company stock like tanked. Um, and a lot of Dutch banks were heavily exposed to the British East India company stock. And it wiped out a lot of Dutch banks and brought down I mean, it almost brought down like the whole Dutch financial center. Um, and at this time, the Dutch financial system was huge. I mean, they were like the center of all financial activity. And so this kind of example of a bunch of banks and people that held money at their banks being exposed to the risk of a single company um, kind of highlighted the risks of concentrated exposures and not being diversified. And so this Dutch broker named Abraham van Ketwich in 1774 decided to um, offer a fund that would have kind of freely traded securities um, where people could buy shares into the fund, which would hold, I think, like the actual portfolio was 50 bonds across a range of categories. So a lot of them were traditional kind of government bonds, but of local governments in Holland and also like a few other European countries bonds. And then also there are things like canal and turnpike bonds um, or revenue streams tied to canals and turnpikes. And it was equally weighted across these, I think it was 10 categories and 50 bonds. And what was interesting is that, um, so it's basically a passive bond index equally weighted. And what was interesting though, is that to ensure that there was no room for kind of human error, kind of going back to what we were just discussing with quant models, they decided to um, have the three portfolio managers of this, this fund um, put all of the shares of the bonds that they had purchased all the kind of physical paper certificates into an iron chest that had three locks and so if anybody if any of those three portfolio managers wanted to kind of react to short-term news or events they couldn't just go open this chest and sell these certificates and sell these positions they would have to all three of them come together with their key and unlock this chest at the same time so you know you kind of talk about your investments being locked up um <laughs> a lockup period this is the definition and the original multi the original multi-sig Bitcoin wallet, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and another really interesting um, aspect of that fund was, I guess, too, it, first it had the great name of Unity Creates Strength, which is like for the innovation of diversified portfolio management. I feel like that's a brilliant name. Um, and also it had a really low expense ratio. I mean, whatever they called it then, but the cost of buying it was and holding was, uh, I think it was like 20 basis points um, by modern standards. So we're kind of back to, I mean, you can find many passive bond funds that I feel like would probably offer something very similar today for 20 basis points. Um, and so it's just interesting that from inception, these funds were cheap. And that guy actually, Abraham Van Ketwich, he was really innovative where he launched a second fund in 1779 and it's considered to be the world's first value fund um, because in the prospectus for this 1779 mutual fund um, the prospectus said that it was like its strategy was to buy securities trading at prices below their intrinsic value and so this guy is kind of like the the true godfather of value investing um, and he also had these interesting kind of dynamics where um, he would buy back shares of the fund from, it, it was like this weird lottery system where shareholders could enter into it and there would be repurchases of their shares um, if like they won that lottery and they would get a payout at a certain premium. And so it was 
this fund was not only doing value investing in the 1800s, but also doing like shareholder repurchases. And so fascinating and very innovative uh, individual. All right, so shifting gears a little bit, we talked to the, I want to touch on the idea of speculation. And when speculation comes to mind, it usually has a negative um, connotation to it. But you've written about the, the fact that there might be some benefits to speculation. What are those benefits? Yeah, so um, I do want to reiterate that overall speculation off, often leads to a lot of people losing money. And it's not to say that just overall, it's definitive answer. It's actually a good thing. Um, it's not that much of a hot take, but I do think that there are some positives and benefits to speculation that are ignored. And I think one of those things is that when there's periods of speculation, the reason these kind of manias form is because more and more people want to achieve the returns that they're seeing others achieve. And so they kind of herd into exciting speculative stocks. And while that often leads to people losing money, it also potentially brings in people, it brings people into the market that might not have otherwise ever been interested in investing. And so obviously the younger people start investing, then the better they can prepare themselves and kind of set themselves up for success down the road um, because they can compound their returns longer over time. And so while looking at NFTs recently, it's easy to just say that person's stupid. They bought a JPEG of a rock for however many dollars. And while you might think that's stupid overall, I think that there's a huge, huge population of people that would probably not have gotten into buying stocks or buying ETFs or investing at all if it wasn't for their interest in the NFT and crypto space drawing them in initially. They might have never been interested at all in investing, but that kind of gateway of crypto exposes them to the just kind of overall concept of investing, of finding an asset you like, buying it, holding it, selling it, et cetera. And then from there, think, you know, oh, well, might as well check out the stock market too and see if I should, you know, buy some ETFs, et cetera. Whereas if there wasn't this kind of speculative boom around NFTs and crypto, then they might have never really gotten into investing until much later. And so people lose money, obviously, but it brings people into the market. Um, and what is an interesting historical parallel um, for this concept is in the early 1900s when bucket shops were beginning to be shut down. Um, so bucket shops, for those who don't know, um, they were weird in that they... So at this time, basically in the late 1800s and early 1900s, the order um, minimums on traditional stock exchanges were just prohibitively high. Um, I think oftentimes if you did all the kind of traditional orders, it would end up costing usually a minimum of like $100,000 to place a trade. And so if you're the average investor, you don't have $100,000 to just dabble in the market. And so you really couldn't access the financial markets or you couldn't access the stock exchange, like New York Stock Exchange. And so um, what happened was that people started turning to bucket shops, which were kind of like, I guess you would say, paper trading apps today, um, where it's all still linked to real time market information. So these bucket shops were plugged in by tickers and telegraph cables to the New York Stock Exchange, and they were getting real time prices. But the prices and shares that people were buying in bucket shops were just purely paper trades. If you bought 50 shares of ABC Railroad in a bucket shop, you weren't actually buying, you didn't own those shares. You were just kind of gambling on the direction of ABC Railroad's price. And so you weren't actually really accessing financial markets because you didn't have an ownership stake, but it was a way that many people became exposed to the market for the first time because they couldn't access um, kind of the markets through traditional exchanges. And this was the only way they could really have any exposure to financial markets. And then in around like 1915 is when the stock exchanges kind of finally succeeded in getting the bucket shops shut down because 
there ended up being a lot of knock on effects from bucket shops that impacted um, the market because what bucket shop kind of operators would do is it is inverse of the stock exchange where on in the bucket shop you know for every dollar that a, a patron in their bucket shop gained the bucket shop lost and then so when the bucket shop operators knew that a bunch of their kind of gamblers in their bucket shop were betting on the direction of uh stock one way and that they would the the speculators would make a lot of money if it went that way and the bucket shop would lose a lot of money then the bucket shop would orchestrate a large order on the real stock exchange to drive that price down so that their speculators in the bucket shop would lose money and so these kind of huge orders to kind of ruin the speculators and bucket shops trades would lead to these really volatile swings on the traditional exchange and so eventually the exchanges got the bucket shops shut down and what ended up happening was a lot of those small bucket shop speculators ended up going to the stock exchange and, and investing there because this kind of whole experience woke up the stock exchanges to the fact that if they lowered their account and order minimums then there was this whole kind of untapped market for smaller speculators and investors and there was many um, stock exchange presidents that came out and said, you know, in the first year since the bucket shop sh shut down, we've seen a huge increase in orders placed through our exchange because, and we know basically that these are all coming from previous bucket shop speculators. And so again, you see this kind of evolution and maturity of what many would have said are degenerate gamblers, you know, speculating in these CD bucket shops into more mature, longer term investors on the stock exchange. And so everyone has a different route into investing. You know, yeah, what you're talking about there actually is reminding me of this conversation I just had with Michael Mobison, where we were talking about what George Soros has coined reflexivity. And we, we brought up Tesla as an example where everybody was speculating on Tesla and it drove the price to the moon. And, but at that point, Tesla was able to raise $8 billion, you know, through equity. And now, build a bunch of plants and do a bunch of great things with it that actually are now, you know, now Tesla's a profitable company as of the last quarter. So it has this positive feedback loop, this self-fulfilling prophecy almost, uh, which I could see as a, a benefit, not exactly tied to what you're talking about, but in my mind, kind of similar to a benefit to speculation. It's just super interesting. All right. One more question for you. I'm, I'm just kind of curious about, you know, what we talk a lot about recently is how the Fed is driving markets by creating new credit, new money, seemingly without limits. I'm wondering if any other time in history comes to mind that's anywhere close to uh, resembling the kind of current monetary policy we're in today. Yeah, so basically, I'd say 90% of the major bubbles and speculative manias we talk about today that occurred in the 19th and 18th centuries all followed an expensive war in Europe and usually involving England. And um, so 1720 South Sea bubble being a perfect example. Um, can't remember the war that it followed, but it was with France and um, and actually the 1690s bubble we talked about followed the nine years war with France. And again, basically what happens is after the war concludes and the British government or any government had raised a lot of money to finance this war, um, after the war ends, they realize, wow, we have a ton of debt <laughs> and this is going to be really expensive to pay all these interest payments um, to bondholders. And so they would either kind of just force investors to accept a reduced interest rate um, or they would come up with creative, um, to put it politely, schemes to get out of paying all this debt. And so that's what you had with the South Sea bubble. What kind of made it so ridiculous was this government uh, debt for equity swap. And so the way that the British government tried to drive enthusiasm um, for the South Sea company was one that gave it the kind of exclusive rights to trading with, I think one of the Spanish colonies. Um, and also they allowed 
um, shares to be purchased using uh, British consul bonds, which were just like treasury equivalent. And so that was a way for the British government to kind of retire a lot of this debt that they had accumulated to finance an expensive war against France was by saying, you can get in on this awesome new South Sea company stock and you can pay for it using the bonds you already own. And so it's a win-win. You can use existing investments to buy this exciting new investment and we will retire those bonds and it just lowers the amount of interest payments that we have to pay. Um, and so today I think a parallel is even though COVID is obviously not a war, it's still, I feel like a lot of the same features as a war where there's kind of a national and if not global kind of movement. Um, and there is a lot of cost associated with shutting the economy down. You have to be able to kind of still allow people to live and sustain <laughs> their livelihood because you force them to shut down their business. So you have stimulus checks, et cetera, and a bunch of money being printed, interest rates at um, just record lows. And so all of this pumping of money into the system creates speculative opportunities and manias in the same way that after these expensive wars throughout history and governments reduced interest rates and people were kind of forced to find sources of return in riskier areas of the market, then bubbles persist. Well, Jamie, this has been so much fun, but I also want to just emphasize everyone should go check out investoramnesia.com. Your Sunday reads are just such a delight to read. And also you've put together a couple of courses that I do want to highlight. Um, and it's not just you leading these courses. You've put together a cohort of experts on the topic, on bubbles, on empires. Really enjoyed it. I learned a ton. Keep what, doing what you're doing and keep the Sunday reads great because I enjoy them on the weekend. So appreciate it so much. And let's do it again. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 